Hey guys. There's this 4chan post that I like to read when I'm particularly defeated and I'm feeling sorry for myself because I have such a hard life complaining online for a living. But really, we do get a lot of backlash and we've all burned bridges with friends and family. So this post has served as a good reminder to keep an appropriate perspective. Daily reminder that 100 plus billion people have lived and died before you were born. And 99.999% were right-wing extremists by today's standards. If they were alive today, they would be even more pissed off than you are, and they would be unbelievably violent. Imagine 100 billion people smiling upon you from heaven as you fight leftist scum. Anyone right of center, and even many leftists, are branded Nazis and right-wing extremists by the regressive left. And sometimes I lose sight of the reality that not only are the people attacking us radical socialists and communists by historical standards, but much of the present day general population is as well. Your average leftist believes in open borders, a giant welfare state and multiculturalism and abortion and collectivization. Most college students are bona fide, shameless communists, but they lack the historical knowledge and self-awareness that should aid in the introduction of, at a minimum, a healthy sense of skepticism towards this warped belief system. Tens of millions of Americans that claim to be morally superior to you openly support ideologies, as well as past and present world leaders, that are responsible for the mass murder of roughly 100 million innocent people. That is the radical worldview. I have a difficult time maintaining an appropriate perspective because of the intense, continuous leftist gaslighting of conservatives. You guys know how it is. Constantly being told that you're ignorant or evil for plainly expressing what would have been obvious to and generally accepted by our grandparents' generation. I have to remind myself that being in a linear timeline does not equate to actual progress. We have clearly regressed intellectually, especially since the early 20th century. The scientific and technological progression has been swift and revolutionary, but it is actually correlated with society at large abandoning common sense principles. Yes, we have vastly improved in terms of technology, medicine, a variety of other aspects. I understand that. But education is not better. And whether or not most lefties are evil, stupid, or merely cowards, the fact remains that they are not intellectually capable enough to avoid mental malleability and the obvious result that they become useful idiots for progressive demagogues. Even my most intellectually confident liberal friends and relatives are slaves to mainstream media outrage culture and don't really possess the ability to think their way out of this unhealthy dependency, no matter how legitimately smart they are. Let's talk about some things that generations past had a better grasp on than we do today. Multiculturalism has perhaps been the single most destructive force to humanity in the modern day. But it is a multifaceted issue and encompasses many others, the most important of which is likely immigration. I did a video a while back on immigration policies throughout American history, which I've linked below. Until 1965, we had immigration policies that favored Europeans, and there were large breaks in between surges with virtually no immigrant flow in order to allow for sustained periods of mandatory integration. This all changed in 1965 when Democrats opened the floodgates to third world migration into America. These were disparate cultures with little incentive or motivation to integrate. It was promised that there would be no demographic change. Edward Kennedy famously said, First, our cities will not be flooded with a million immigrants annually. Under the proposed bill, the present level of immigration remains substantially the same. Secondly, the ethnic mix of this country will not be upset. Contrary to the charges in some quarters, the bill will not inundate America with immigrants from any one country or area, or the most populated and deprived nations of Africa and Asia. In the final analysis, the ethnic pattern of immigration under the proposed measure is not expected to change as sharply as the critics seem to think. Of course, we now know this to be a massive lie, and it's been even worse than the claim that Edward Kennedy and other Democrats thought was so paranoid. So before Americans were fooled into virtually destroying the country that they built, there was a realistic and vastly superior mentality concerning cultural integration. Americans, and all Western countries for that matter, had distinct cultural values and a sense of nationalism that your average citizen wanted to protect and retain for those that built the nation. Now, it's not uncommon for Americans to think that not only is their culture evil, but it needs to be destroyed. I would even argue that this is a fundamental tenet of the brain virus of liberalism. Shame, guilt, and in an act of exorcism of their own self-loathing conscience, destruction of culture, state, and shared values. This relates to democracy as well. The founders were aware that in a true democracy, if you have two poor men and a rich man, the two poor men will vote to take the wealth of the rich. 
True democracies often vote to impose tyranny on themselves. This is the reason that we have a constitutional republic, although it didn't really prevent this from happening. Of course, the founders did not foresee the fundamental change in American values that would occur largely through a massive flood of immigrants from vastly different and largely incompatible cultures. Nor did they foresee that these new Americans would be so bold that they would not even hide their intent to reallocate resources to their communities. Perhaps this is due to the framers' high respect for your average American. People back then were settlers and possessed much more self-reliance than folks today. There was less narcissism because people had hard lives. When four of your nine children don't make it to age five, there isn't much room in your life for self-importance. It was about survival and keeping faith, which is another aspect of the founders' lives that lent to their trust in the American people. They were mostly Christian. But it wasn't just value and cultural homogeneity that reinforced the founders' principles. There were also clear-cut expectations for men and women and very defined gender roles. Reflecting on this, I think the most obvious example of our move away from common sense has got to be our treatment of gender and gender roles. It's so ridiculous now. Before even the last decade or so, I mean, there was not a single training at my high school of 2000 students in 2006. There were universally accepted expectations of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man. Transgenderism is such a new phenomenon, so perhaps it's not a perfect example. But even in terms of gender relations, marriages were stronger and more sustainable before no-fault divorce, and husbands and wives operated within their defined realms in order to aid in their mutual survival and that of their children. Now that that's been lost, marriages fail much more often and the marriage rate is way down. The gender relations that were forged in much earlier generations worked, and once we stopped adhering to these guidelines, relationships between men and women started to deteriorate. So outside of immigration, why is it that we've shunned the lessons of yesteryear and made way for a set of social rules and values that have made us dumber and less functional as a society? In more recent decades, we've had access to the internet. The internet era has clearly caused a reliance on accessible information and reduced our critical thinking skills. It's counterintuitive because you would think that the defining factor would actually be the amount of and access to information. But the unintended consequence of having the immediate answers to all of our questions at our fingertips is that we're required to exercise our brains much less than was previously necessary. We also read much less literature and the internet has clearly shortened our attention spans. Another aspect of this dumbing down is the collective loss of religion. We aren't thinking on a macro scale anymore. We don't have the same kind of accountability. It's very difficult when irreligious to develop a staunch framework of morality and a value system that one dutifully adheres to. What's the incentive? There's no moral accountability. A spiritual relationship with God creates an incentive for good behavior and it gives humans perspective. It reminds us that we're all small, weak, fallen. Like I mentioned earlier, this may have kept our narcissism in check. So what about education? Surely, that's improved century over century, right? Education is far worse now. Somehow one-room classrooms were considerably better. I've talked about it many times, but this isn't merely due to shortfalls in present-day academics, although you would be shocked to see how little your average college freshman knows, how few of the classics they've read, and how little perspective they've gained considering that they're technically adults. The real issue today is that modern education does not just fail to improve students' knowledge base, but actually makes them dumber. You're better off being ignorant of world events but not fundamentally indoctrinated than having a warped lens through which you view everything in your life for the rest of your life. The level of indoctrination in academia is startling. Students aren't just skipping classics like Dante's Inferno or Beowulf. Readings that should be giving our students an understanding of broader moral questions are being replaced entirely in curriculum to make way for modern literature that favors the cult of multiculturalism above any universal concept of morality. I've also made a video about leftist indoctrination in my high school and college curriculum, so I'll link that below as well. In the 1960s, in conjunction with immigration reform, there was postmodernist saturation in academia, which led to an ideological tipping point. We reached apex America in the 50s, then we slid into something unrecognizable. Like we discussed, of course this is related to education and immigration, but there were additional factors that compounded the emerging negative effects. Some of it must be that we've had all of our basic needs met for generations now, and the lack of survival skill has muted our ingenuity and tempered our revolutionary spirit. Everybody in this realm knows this saying, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. Some of our societal decay is just cyclical because we've become soft and weak from having easy lives, and at least that much will inevitably resolve itself. Today I was listening to Stefan Molyneux talk about societal relearning in his video about Stormy Daniels, which I've linked below. 
He was talking about it in terms of sexual morality, which is a very good example of the type of relearning that we'll have to do so that we can again reap the benefits of conventional wisdom. Much earlier generations knew that we shouldn't be promiscuous because it resulted in grave consequences. Single mothers were like untouchables and had destroyed their lives. They would be a permanent state liability with little hope to ever marry, and STDs like syphilis would literally eat your face. These consequences were mitigated to some degree because of modern medicine and the welfare state, but the latter is unsustainable. So there will be a period of societal relearning when welfare benefits inevitably run out. I think Stefan said that it's inevitable because math. And single moms and other government-dependent members of society return to destitution. Men marry single moms now because there is a per-child financial incentive to do so. But when these women can no longer rely on the state, they will likely return to their previous untouchable status. Of course, the societal relearning will be horrible for people, especially because we do not have the skills and self-reliance that previous generations had. But the silver lining is that these hard times will produce a more resilient society that is far less government dependent. It's so important to have historical perspective. Without it, you're untethered and will adopt standard modern philosophies without even realizing it. Most people just want to blend into society. So if society generally holds incorrect viewpoints that resulted from intense and thorough communist indoctrination, those that passively engage in the culture will be relative extremists from a broader historical vantage point. This is why I have a hard time giving a pass to your average person that is apathetic about politics, but still embodies or endorses dangerous elements of the modern paradigm. For example, your average person that lives in Seattle but doesn't care about politics will still hold the view that women are oppressed and abused in Western societies, or that white men are inherently racist, or that masculinity is innately toxic. That is the social norm, and those opinions are not only incorrect, but are detrimental to rebuilding a functional society. Not to mention that they're indisputably far-left viewpoints that have worked their way into average, everyday discourse. So remember this when you're told that you're an extremist, that your views are intolerable and evil, invalid and foolish. You are not on the fringe, no matter how absurd society has become or how much they proclaim that you're the crazy one. Your worldview was a typical centrist perspective back when citizens were more educated, more well-rounded, and had more tangible skills. No matter what they say, you are grounded. You're based. And although they're gone, you have more than 100 billion people on your side. Thanks, folks, and I'll see you soon. Bye.